No dot py. That's in the counter for ep. And there's a dot. Yep. Okay. Well, I guess I'll walk through it again here. Okay. So the counterparty, this is going to go over the counterparty D, uh, counterparty application stack right here. So you have a few components here. The first one, the base one, is Bitcoin D. Uh, Bitcoin D has a JSON RPC interface, API interface to it. You also have Insight. So Insight is a product that was created by uh, BitPay. And the go what Insight basically does is that Bitcoin D itself, that API, you can't query an arbitrary address. Uh, for balance information or to get unsigned transaction outputs, UTXOs. So Insight provides an API, it's kind of like a REST API, it's a more basic API, to get that information um, from any kind of arbitrary address. And, uh, uh, before that, could we just get an introduction? Oh, yeah. So my name is Robbie Dermody, I'm one of the counterparty developers, and I'm uh, just going to go over some of the technology here that's in use with, uh, with counterparty. Okay. So this this whole thing right here, this is a stack that's called a like a federated node stack. This is like the technology stack that we use essentially um, for like a counter wallet server. You go to that that uses a stack, but it's also a stack that you can through a script uh, set a federated node in the counter party D build system. This script will go through and create this whole stack of all these applications, set it all up for you, and you can build your own applications off of this. Or you could just set these components up manually yourself if you wanted to, if you wanted to do it yourself. You may not need these two. You could just have counter D and Bitcoin D, for instance. So it just really depends on your how you want to do it. But this is really just a walkthrough of this technology itself um, to, to kind of explain the, the components and how they relate to each other. Um, so yeah, so we have Bitcoin D. We got Insight, the role that that has. Counter D is a counterparty reference client. So counterparty D essentially um, it will communicate to Bitcoin D, the JSON RPC interface. Uh, it also can communicate to Insight optionally. Um, how Counterparty D works it is essentially it will um, connect to Bitcoin D. It will download from the first Counterparty block. So there's like the origin block of the Counterparty. And there's one block ID with mainnet. There's one with testnet. Um, depending on how you launch Counterparty D, mainnet or testnet, it, it will connect to Bitcoin D. Uh, Bitcoin D and that also has to be running on mainnet or test on the same kind of mode. We'll query the API interface and say, give me all the give me give me give me this block. Okay, it looks at all the transactions for that block. It decodes all the data and then it sees if it's a counterparty D transaction. There's a prefix on that data that it looks for. And if it is, it decodes it as a counterparty D transaction in a given format. So um, yeah, if you want to That's okay. Set the phone. Okay, cool. So, so, uh, cool. So that, so that's a counterparty D. It basically goes from block to block to block. So when you initially set this up, everyone knows Bitcoin D itself takes about, oh, you know, 12 a day. You know, it takes a while to get started. You can get Bitcoin D running. You start up Insight, get that running. It has to sync up. That takes about a similar amount of time to get all that data going and, and, and pull it in. Counterparty D will take about a day as well. You can, you can run these two at the same time. You could probably run this one at the same time, too, and get them all syncing up, and it will, it'll, it'll murder your box. I mean, it's, it's pretty, <laughs> pretty resource-intensive. But once you get these components up, and, and I'm pulling all this data in, and you go through that once, you can just copy these data files from, to another, from one server to another. So Bitcoin D is about, like, eight, what, 18 gigs now? Insights, maybe about 9 or so gigs. Uh, Counterparty D is about 60 megs, I think. I have to look the exact size. Um, once you do that, you just stop the daemon, copy the files over to another server, start up the daemon on that other server, and it will see that that data is there. Um, Counterblock D, what Counterblock D is, it basically layers on top of Counterparty D. So Counterparty D only knows about Counterparty transactions. So Counterblock D will layer on top of Counterparty D, and it knows about things like price feeds, uh, it knows about asset history. So it works off of something called the um, message feed. So Counterparty D has the transactions, like so certain things like sends, uh, for instance, is a Bitcoin transaction. Uh, you know, it's a Counterparty transaction, obviously embedded in a Bitcoin transaction. But there's other things like bet expirations, for instance, and uh, order expirations, and bet and order matches. Those are actually not transactions, they're not Bitcoin transactions, because that's something that you, cr you have one party create an order, another party creates an order, 
and then the protocol will automatically match those two orders and create order matches from that. Or those orders are not matched, or they're not fully matched, and then there's an order expiration. That stuff right there, nobody makes a Bitcoin transaction, a counterparty transaction to do that. So, um, but they are messages. So, mess so transactions are like a subset of messages. And a message is basically any database change to the counterparty D database, which is a SQL-like database. It's a, it's a file-based database. So, counterparty tracks all those counterparty tracks all those database changes into a messages table, and then it provides an API as part of its JSON RPC API, which is fully documented in, online, um, to grab those messages. So you can say, give me all the messages in this Bitcoin block. You can say, give me a message with this specific message ID. So for instance, on the counter wallet website page, you go to statistics or stats on that. Um, it will show you like all the transactions by given day. All that that's doing is kind of block D basically compose that by going through the message feed from the first block to the last block and it basically categorizes these messages as they came in from block to block and counts them up and then just stores that in its database. Um, so 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 kind of block D essentially synchronizes to counter party D, goes through the messages feed from the first block to the last block. This process, unlike this, that takes about ten a day maybe to, to complete, this process takes about ten minutes because it's going off of those pre-digested counterparty transactions or messages on the feed. Um, it will compose things like asset history, like a, an asset like, you know, when was it created? Then it was transferred over here. Then more, more, more units of that asset were issued. Um, then it was locked. So counterparty D, you'd have to go through the blocks to see that because all it knows about is transactions. But counter block D goes, does that. It goes through all the messages, and then it essentially composes that history in a table. It uses MongoDB on the back end, um, so it's NoSQL where this is a SQL database, and it provides its own JSON RPC interface. Uh, right now, that interface, API.py, it's right now it's an undocumented interface. It's like you basically just have to go through and read the Python code. That interface is really developed for Counter Wallet D itself. I'm sorry, Counter Wallet, which is a web wallet itself. However, uh, you know we're going to be documenting it here shortly, and it is an interface that other ap applications can use. So if your application needs something like more advanced than transactions, check out Counter Counter Block D's API interface and see like if you need like price history data, market data, order book status, asset histories, things like that, this database could be useful for and this API could be useful for you. Um, so on top of this you have the JSON RPC interface, you have Nginx that is part of like the federated node. You don't have to run Nginx if you set up your own server, but we do. Um, it exposes the, the counter wallet source code and assets. It also exposes a proxy interface to counter block D and counter party D. So then on top of this, what we do is, so we have counter wallet running. Counter wallet essentially has just the Java makes, makes API calls through jQuery to through Nginx up to counter block D or counter party D. So it can make, it can make API calls directly uh, to counter party D or to counter block D. Um, the API calls are proxy through Nginx and if it's a counter block D, call it one here. Otherwise, counter block D has a proxy to counter party D API call, which will just proxy that call to counter party D itself. Um, there's some options. We may expose the full API as a transparent link to counter block D or allow it to, to communicate directly to counter party D. But right now, we just proxy it through for you know, simplicity and security reasons. Um, so let's see here. So. Uh, Counter Wallet, it has a it has what's called multi API. So you take this this federated node structure right. This is this is a federated node. This guy right here, all this this stack. So this is the application stack for federated node. This util API, you can have multiple federated nodes. Um, so right now, Counter Wallet in, in this beta phase is, is running on a server, a single server. But we're adding actually uh, next week or this week, we'll be adding additional servers to it. So it has this util API. There's a few ways it can run. So say you have like two two separate servers. You have failover failover API. It's called it's a function called failover API. What happens is that when, when you let me back up. When you actually start the wallet, you go to the website. Some code initializes that basically downloads a servers.json file. It has a list of the servers in it. Say there's two servers in that list. It will shuffle that list around, 
and then it will essentially, that's the list of servers for that session. So you get a random ordering of those servers. So if you have five servers, it shuffles those five servers around. Then when it makes calls, a Thalibur API call, what that does is it calls to the first server. If that server returns an error, it will call to the second server and then the third server and so on until it gets to the end of the list to the first server that it gives a success result. So that's useful like for getting like price feed data, where you just want to like one server may be down or one server may be having an issue, you just want to get the first successful result. There's also multi-API, which is useful like for storing preferences. What that does is it basically makes a call to all the servers at one time. And it doesn't really care about the results as much, it's like you want to store user preferences redundantly across all the servers. It's kind of like poor man's failover, so to say, is how this works. Um, there's multi-API uh, newest, which is good like when you're retrieving uh, preferences data. So what that does is it calls across all the servers, and then what it does is it's going to get the, the newest uh, data that's returned based on some kind of date field. So we have like a last updated date field for the user preferences, which is stored server side right now. Like how many addresses does the user have created? Um, you know what what uh, what else is it stored? Like what are nicknames for the addresses? So like you can name your addresses in Counter Wallet. So that's just like this JSON data structure, essentially. It's a JSON dictionary. Um, and so the multi-API newest. Then you have uh, multi-API consensus. What that does is it calls out all, all the systems that are in that list, and it, and it gets a result, and it makes sure all those results match. And if they don't, it will give an error to the client. That's useful for create sends. Any of these create calls, like creating a send, creating an order, where, say, if one of the servers got hacked and the stuff was replaced to return bogus data, it would know that because it calls into a, one of the one of those data uh, one one of the uh, the returned hex transactions uh, raw transactions is off. It's different, so it gives an error, and then we know that something's up. Um, so that's basically how multi API works. Uh, let's see here. So future plans with CounterWallet, we're going to move this off right now. This data sits on the server side. We're going to be moving it off to its own Chrome application, um, so that those assets are local. That will enhance security. Uh, having multiple servers with the multi-API stuff will be a, f a farther security enhancement. Um, and then making it so CounterWallet itself can compose the transaction. So right now for CounterWallet to say you want to send XCP to someone in CounterWallet, what it does is it makes a create send API called the counterparty D and it provides the public key of one of the, it's a deterministic wallet, so all the private keys sit here in the, in the web browser. And it provides a public key to one of those one of those uh, addresses to Counterparty D. Counterparty D composes his transaction using that private key. I'm, that, I'm sorry, that public key returns that raw transaction hex back down to call it Counter Wallet. Counter Wallet will sign that raw transaction and then it will broadcast it. So I can broadcast it out through blockchain.info, or I can send it back up to here and it can be sent off this Bitcoin D. So future plan is to make it so that this actually encodes the actual data itself, uh, the, the, the transaction itself signs it. It signs it today, so the private keys will never leave the, the browser. They never go into the server side. We never see them. We never see the passphrase either. Um, so that, that will farther increase security as well. So our goals with this is to enhance security as much as possible. So for developers that want to build on this platform, uh, you can you can uh, do this today. Essentially, there's a set of federated node Python script in the in the in the um, uh, counterparty underscore counterparty underscore build repository in GitHub. There's a document in that docs directory for that for set up federated node, um, and it tells you about what a federated node is. It talks about this multi API stuff, and it is essentially you just run that you just download that set of federated <coughs> script on the Ubuntu system, run it, and it sets up all of the stuff for you, and then you can just like it tells you just how to start up the programs, get them syncing, and get going with the technology. And at that point, most people are just going to need to interact with Counterparty API. If you need some more extended stuff, you can look in the Counterblock D API. But I would get started here. We have API documentation. Um, and then you can basically learn what that API is about for your needs. And then you can all look in the API files here. If you want to see how these API functions are used in a web application, check out the CounterWallet source code. Um, so that's basically an overview of, of the third party application stack today. So thank you very much. Um, we'll have this thing up somewhere so people can see it. All right.